It's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Gray uh, today for the Wednesday seminar. So Daniel has been working in our division for a bit more than four years now. Um, he's an immunologist, I won't hold that against him. And uh, he, did, um, he did his PhD with uh, Richard Boyd at Monash. Again, uh, I'm not holding them against him. Um, he worked uh, as a PhD student on uh, the development of the thymus, but not from the hemopoietic cell side so much, but more from the thymic epithelial cell side. And um, he went then on and took that interest um, to Boston, where he worked with Diane Mattis and Christophe Benoit, working on the air gene, which is critical for presentation of antigens in the thymus by the epithelial and some non-epithelial cells um, to impose tolerance. Uh, he has a huge interest in, in immunological tolerance and um, how this works both from the side of antigen presentation and from the response of the lymphoid cells. And uh, probably because of that, um, he came uh, with a C.J. Martin fellowship uh, to join our division and um, he's done extremely well. And um, uh, as a result of that, he became a lab head um, at the end of last year. Um, uh, Daniel is somebody who... Um, uh, does things in spurts. He doesn't do them um, very um, over a long time spread out, but uh, he got within six months, uh, he got married, he got um, three first or senior authorship papers in nature immunology and immunity, and he bought a house. So I, I, I told him he might as well retire from life after that because there, there was surely no way to sustain that. <laughs> or even top it, but he's, he's trying, so um, both on the personal front as well as the scientific one, so thanks a lot, Daniel. Uh, thanks, Andreas. I'm trying to top it. I'm expecting our first daughter in November, but professionally how I top it, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But I uh, appreciate the introduction, nevertheless. So today I'm going to talk to you about apoptosis and immunological tolerance. And, and these two terms have become almost synonymous, actually. The concept that the body disposes of potentially dangerous lymphocytes by apoptosis to protect it from autoimmune disease was predicted by Burnett and was one of the first tolerance mechanisms that was demonstrated experimentally. But it's only really been recently that we have a more complete understanding of the, the apoptotic mechanisms that actually impose cell death that we've been able to really kind of test this contention that apoptosis or deletion of thymocytes is really important um, for this, for human health. So um, I thought then I should introduce um, the problem. So what is immunological tolerance? So immunological tolerance is evolution's response to the problem of self-reactivity. And so the, the root of this problem is that the immune system ahead of time doesn't actually know what kind of pathogens the body will encounter throughout life. And so the response to this then was to randomize the process by which lymphocytes recognize pathogens. And this was done by the random recombination of the genes that encode the T and B cell receptors for antigens. And so that gives rise to a huge diversity of different kinds of lymphocytes represented here by the different colors of these different cells. And it's so successful actually that in humans it's estimated there are up to 10 to the 11 different antigen specificities that are circulating in an adult every day. And so this huge diversity of antigen receptors then allows for just about any immune response to be mounted against pathogens. So the way this works is then that the appropriate T or B cell clones that, that happen to recognize components of pathogens become activated, multiply greatly in number, but maintain the clonality of their antigen receptor so that they can then respond to the pathogen and clear it from the body to maintain homeostasis. Okay, so that's great. So the, one of the great features is there's this huge diversity, but the problem is there's this huge diversity. So that means that it's almost inevitable that there'll be some lymphocytes here that can recognize your own tissues, represented here by these very accurate pictures. So when that happens, when cells that recognize your own tissues are activated and, and mount an immune response, the result is autoimmune diseases. Now, these are actually a huge health burden affecting about one in 20 people, and it's becoming more prevalent with our aging population. And they tend to be chronic diseases, so they don't necessarily kill you straight away, but they're a huge health burden. And there are over 80 different kinds of autoimmune diseases, generally defined by the kind of target tissues that, they, uh, that the immune system 
uh, mounts in a response to. Now, the reason, though, that 95% of us don't have an autoimmune disease is that co-evolving with these mechanisms is the property of immunological tolerance. Okay? So this refers to, collectively, many different ways that the immune system maintains a state of non-responsiveness <coughs> against your own tissues. Now, some of the ways are shown here. These are referred to as tolerance mechanisms. And they can be divided into two major groups. One are the central tolerance mechanisms that operate in the thymus and the bone marrow during the T and B cell differentiation. And then there's peripheral mechanisms that act on the mature product of those processes, so the ones that are circulating in the periphery, the outside immune system. And you'll notice that there are very many of these different mechanisms that have been proposed. All of these have been shown very convincingly in experimental systems. But the challenge for immunologists now is to try and understand which of these are truly important for human health. Now, there have been some clues through experiments of nature. These are genetic diseases that have given us a real insight into those tolerance mechanisms that are essential for health. So one example is APESED. This is uh, an autoimmune disease that affects multiple organs in an individual. It can be type 1 diabetes, autoimmune hepatitis, pneumonitis, you name it. These poor individuals get affected by many different kinds of autoimmune diseases. And it's caused by a monogenic mutation to the gene air or the autoimmune regulator. And what this does is impairs the expression in the thymus of antigens that you would normally only find in particular organs, things like insulin or thyroglobulin that are normally restricted just to particular organs in the periphery. Air drives a preview of those antigens inside the thymus so that the T cells that might be reactive to them are removed or that tolerance can be induced to those cells that might otherwise cause an autoimmune disease. Without air, you get those autoimmune diseases. Another, another syndrome that was very informative is this called IPEX. Um, and this really shed light on the importance of a particular subset of lymphocytes called regulatory T cells. Now, regulatory T cells require this transcription factor, FOXP3, for their function um, and development. And people that bear mutations, loss of function mutations in FOXP3, come down with a devastating um, autoimmune and inflammatory disorder called IPEX. And this disease really highlighted the importance of regulatory T cells for immune homeostasis and immunological tolerance. Okay, so the way that immunologists tend to view how the immune system sorts out the dangerous cells from the safe cells can be represented on this little scheme here. And so this is a representation of thymic T cell development, but the same kind of holds true for B cells. And so on the Y axis, we're just plotting the number of thymocytes and on the X axis, is the affinity that this T cell receptor, this antigen receptor that's been randomly generated, the affinity it has for self-peptide MHC complexes presented to them in the thymus. Now, because it's a random process, most of the cells actually rearrange a fairly useless receptor that cannot recognize self-MHC peptide, and these cells are killed by neglect via an apoptotic mechanism. However, there are always going to be some cells that can recognize self-MHC peptide complexes with a kind of a low affinity and these cells uh, receive a survival signal and go on to be what's called positively selected. They mature into the T cells, populate the periphery, and these are the ones that provide for immune responses. However, there's a threshold of affinity above which it's interpreted that it might be too dangerous to allow this cell to go on and mature as a normal T cell. That the affinity, that the, the, the avidity that the TCR binds to cell peptide MHC is too high and that these cells might pose a threat if they were to be released these cells undergo a process called negative selection. Now, negative selection actually composed of many different tolerance mechanisms, the most prominent of which is clonal deletion. This is this process of apoptosis I was referring to at the beginning that kills a cell that might otherwise pose a threat. There are other mechanisms like um, editing the receptor or energy, which is the functional inactivation of those cells. Or they can be sent down a different pathway that is harmless, um, harmless to the organism and then exported into the periphery. But basically, negative selection refers to the removal of potentially dangerous specificities. Okay, so here's what it might look like in the thymus. It almost certainly doesn't look exactly like this, but here's what a scheme of what it might look like in the thymus. And so here's a thymocyte that's randomly rearranged a TCR that recognizes self-peptide MHC complexes with a very high affinity. That's dangerous. And so the way that's interpreted is it interacts with these complexes on thymic epithelial cells, let's say. This one's expressing this autoimmune regulator and providing a preview of these peripheral organs to the developing thymocytes. 
As a consequence of that, these cells upregulate a pro-apoptotic molecule called BIM, okay? And it's BIM that drives the deletion of these cells, okay? And this was very elegantly shown by Philippe Bouillet many years ago, and there's been more demonstrations <coughs> since, that BIM is a critical molecule for the deletion of, of thymocytes that might be autoreactive. However, when I came to the lab, there was a curious observation, though, which was that BIM-deficient mice do not get the same kind of autoimmune diseases that air-deficient mice do, okay? So if this is really a mirror of this process, the presentation of antigens by air to thymocytes that might interact with them and otherwise be dangerous, being killed by BIM, we should expect that many of the autoimmune phenotypes we see in air-deficient mice, we should also see in BIM knockout mice. But we don't. What we do see in BIM knockout mice is kind of a systemic autoimmune disease, a bit like lupus. But we don't see any of the organ-specific pathology that we observe in air knockout mice and people. Okay, so why, why might that be? Well, two explanations offered themselves to us. One was that, first of all, T cell deletion, after all, is not important for immunological tolerance. And that, in fact, other mechanisms are sufficient to prevent autoimmune disease in the absence of deletional mechanisms like BIM. Another interpretation that we kind of favored for obvious reasons is that there might be other mediators of apoptosis that can actually mediate tolerance to organ-specific antigens when BIM is not around. So perhaps BIM takes care of tolerance to some antigens, but other molecules take care of antigens that are regulated by air. Okay, so to explore this second pathway a little bit more, I have to tell you a bit about how apoptosis seems to work. It can be divided into two pathways, the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is mediated by death receptors like Fas ligand or TRAIL and so forth. And these don't really seem to be important for the for thymic mechanisms, the deletion that is imposed in the thymus uh, and the bone marrow um, during B cell development. So I'm not going to talk much more about this pathway today. What we will focus, though, is on the intrinsic pathway. And the real fulcrum of the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis is the activation of two proteins, BACs and BAC. If these proteins become activated, they permeabilize the mitochondria, and this begins a cascade of events that irreversibly causes the apoptosis of the cell. So this really, the activation of back and backs is the point of no return for the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. So a very dramatic outcome. So it's under very strict regulation by other members of the BCL2 family of proteins. These can be broadly divided into two. One is the pro-survival members of the BCL2 family, and this is shown here in blue. And the other are the pro-apoptotic members of the, of the BCL2 family, the BH3-only proteins. The pro-survivals restrain the activation of BAC and BACs, and these are the ones that hold primacy in healthy cells. However, when there's a cytotoxic stimulus, such as cytokine deprivation or ER stress, this can cause the upregulation or activation of these BH3-only proteins. And their activity either sequesters away the pro-survival proteins, and thereby relieving their inhibition of BAC and BACs, or they can directly activate BAC and BACs to cause this mitochondrial permeabilization and this apoptotic cascade, the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Now, if that's not complicated enough, it turns out there are very many different members of each of these proteins. So for the BCL2 pro-survivals, there's at least five members, including the prototypical BCL2. And for the BH3-only protein, there are up to eight different members. And the expression profile of these BCL2 family members differs in different cell types. And it's not always predictable exactly which cytotoxic stimuli are going to provoke um, different members of these to um, execute apoptosis in different cell types. So generally, it has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so to address this question, that second interpretation we had about deletion, or maybe there's other apoptotic mediators involved, we asked this question, does the combined loss of BIM and other of these BH3-only proteins that I showed here, does the combined loss of these proteins lead to autoimmune disease? So the experimental model we turned to was this was this reconstitution of immunodeficient mice. So basically, these mice are a clean slate, and we're going to reconstitute them with hematopoietic precursors from a negative-controlled wild-type mice or a positive-controlled VAV BCL2 transgenic mice that overexpress the pro-survival protein BCL2, which globally inhibits the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. And then we're going to wait eight weeks and then analyze the organs that we know are normally affected in air-deficient mice. So we also included precursors from BIM knockout mice. Based on our previous studies, we were not expecting to see any autoimmunity in that case. But then we also took hematopoietic precursors from a range of different compound mutants 
that lack BIM plus other BH3 only proteins. We took HSCs from these guys, we constituted these mice, and then looked to see if autoimmunity would ensue. Okay, so a summary of some of the data is shown here. These are just H&E sec stained sections of salivary gland, liver, lung, or pancreas. These are target organs um, in the air disease. And here on the top here, uh, the hematopoietic precursors we took from either wild type mice or bad BCL2 transgenics or these various knockouts to reconstitute the RAG deficient mice. And you can see here that basically in wild type um, precursors elicit very no, no autoimmune disease. And nor did precursors derive from the BIM deficient mice. Our positive control work though, because here in black arrows, I'm showing you the lymphocytic infiltration and signs of autoimmunity that um, we saw in the chimeras that had VAV BCL2 transgenic bone marrow. And you can see here there's kind of this impressive destruction of the exocrine pancreas uh, in these mice, and it actually caused uh, a nasty wasting disease in these mice. The only other situation where we saw this kind of autoimmunity was when we reconstituted mice with precursors from tumor BIM deficient mice. Noxibim didn't do it, and nor did a number of other compound mutants that um, I showed you on the previous slide. It was only those that lack puma and BIM that show the signs of hepatitis, pneumonitis, and this exocrine pancreatitis. The exocrine pancreatitis is shown here at a larger um, magnification. It's quite devastating. So these are the pink acinar cells, the exocrine portion uh, of the pancreas. And you can see these dark purple staining lymphocytes that have infiltrated into the organ and are going through and destroying these acinar cells and leaving behind this sort of ductal scar tissue. But what is interesting, and I've highlighted in these little black arrows, is that the islets, the endocrine portion of the pancreas, are completely spared in this disease, even though there's this kind of devastating destruction of the rest of the pancreas. Okay, so what is the evidence that this is autoimmune in nature? Well, one of the experiments we did was to take serum from these mice that we'd reconstituted, and we stained a range of the different target organs with their serum. And in green, we're showing you reactivity to, to those um, tissues, and in blue, it's just a DAPI counter stain. And you can see in serum from wild type mice, we see really no evidence of there being autoantibodies in those serums directed against these, um, these tissues. However, in all of the other situations, we could see, we could detect antibodies in the serum that were directed against the target organs, indicating that there's at least partial loss of tolerance in all of these mice. And we know that in the Puma BIM and the VAB BCL2 transgenic that this was accompanied by um, destruction of certain tissues. Okay, so the problem with this model, though, is that we're starting with a lymphopenic mouse, the RAG knockout mouse, and it's known that this is quite a sensitizer for different kinds of autoimmune diseases. And so we asked the question, then, what happens spontaneously, though? And indeed, we observed if we aged humid BIM double-deficient mice, we could see signs of organ-specific autoimmunity in these same target organs. So here we are just showing these. Uh, this is lymphocytic infiltration of the exocrine pancreas again, the salivary gland, the liver, uh, the, the lacrimal gland that makes tears. Uh, and also the thyroid gland. These are much milder in nature compared to what I showed you with that, that uh, reconstitution model. But nevertheless, there are signs of autoimmune disease directed against specific organs in the Puma BIM deficient mice. And it was really only in the Puma BIM deficient mice that we saw significant disease. And here we're scoring it using a clinical score that sums the severity of the lymphocytic infiltration in a range of organs. And you can see in mice lacking single BH3 only proteins, we got really no disease. In air knockout mice, we get kind of a mild, moderate disease that affects a number of different organs. BIM deficient mice don't really give us much autoimmune disease, but it was really only when we had mice that lacked both puma and BIM, these are the aged mice now, that we saw significant signs of autoimmune disease that was greater than what we saw in BIM knockout mice and other of the compound mutants. Okay, and this is about par with, a little higher than what we see normally in air knockout mice, although you can see there's a large spread in this data. At any rate, we concluded then that both BIM and Puma are required to maintain immunological tolerance. Okay, so how is that? We did a series of experiments where we would transfer T cells from Puma BIM deficient mice into RAG knockout mice to see whether we could recapitulate the disease, and that, that did recapitulate the disease. We saw the exocrine pancreatitis, the sialitis, and these other, uh, these other signs indicating that there's been a break in T cell tolerance that was driving this disease. Okay, so then we went back to the thymus where T cells are made, and we just tried to study the different sequences in thymocyte differentiation to see if we could get at why Puma BIM deficient mice have a worse disease. And so one way we can look at this is by analyzing the expression of the co-receptors CD4 and CD8. 
These go through a direct sequence during thymocyte differentiation, such that T cell progenitors, the most immature ones in the thymus, express neither CD4 nor CD8. Now, those cells undergo this process of TCR gene rearrangement, this randomization of the T cell receptor, and if they, um, they then mature into double positive thymocytes that express both CD4 and CD8, shown in this gate here. Now, these cells are auditioning for these selection events, okay? They're trying to discover whether they have a TCR that might be useful or one that might be dangerous. If they survive these processes, they then differentiate into either CD4 single positive cells, the precursors of CD4 cells in the periphery, or CD8 single positive cells, the precursors of CD8. And if we compare the thymocyte profiles in wild type mice to BIM deficient mice, we notice a few changes. The most obvious of which is there's an accumulation of these more mature CD4 and CD8 single positive thymocytes. And this, we know now, is a sign of this impaired deletion process. Because the cells that are maturing through here, there's a certain portion that are culled by this process of deletion. In the absence of BIM, that doesn't happen, and you get an accumulation of CD4 and CD8 single positive cells at the expense of the more immature progeny. So then we took a look at a, a range of these different compound mutants to see if we could find a worsening of this defect. In noxabim deficient mice, you can see the, pr the proportions are relatively the same, but in pumabim deficient mice, we see a different scenario. We see an accumulation, a further accumulation, of CD4 and CD8 single positive thymocytes um, in, the, in the thymus. This is probably better seen on this um, graphical representation here of the percentage of these different thymocyte subsets for a variety of different mice, like in BIM or Noxa and BIM, et cetera. And probably the best one to look at is this gray bar here. That's the proportion of double positive thymocytes, right? The more immature ones. And in wild type mice, it's about 85%. It drops in BIM deficient mice because of the accumulation of these CD4 and CD8 single positive cells. In all of these other double knockouts, Noxa, BAD, BID, and BMF, we saw no change in these proportions. It was only when we took away Puma in addition to BIM that there was a further worsening of the thymocyte defects that we see in BIM deficient mice. This can get a little bit worse. If we take out the entire uh, intrinsic pathway by removing back and backs, we can see there's, a, there's still further a small drop, but it's, we think that Puma and BIM really do most of the heavy lifting in the apoptotic processes that occur during thymocyte differentiation. So we could conclude then that the loss of Puma exacerbates the thymocyte defects that we see in BIM deficient mice. Okay, but could we find anything that differentiates BIM Puma mice from BIM knockout mice? Well, we could. If we took a bit of a closer look at these mature CD4 or CD8 single positive compartments, we could find evidence of further defects. And so one way we could look at the maturation of these cells is by a variety of markers, including CD69, CD24, and QA2. And these, these cells spend a few days in the thymic medulla, scanning epithelial cells and dendritic cells uh, before they exit the thymus as mature T cells. And so as this process proceeds, these markers change. And in each of these, I've gated upon the cells that are most mature within these subsets, OK? And so in wild-type mice, that's about 30%. In BIM knockout mice, that doesn't change. It's only when we remove Puma in addition to BIM that we see a further accumulation of this most mature subset of CD4 single positive thymocytes. And the same happens in the CD8 compartment as well. I'm just showing it in two different ways here. And so the compound loss of both BIM and Puma led to a relative increase in these mature single positive thymocytes. And we don't see that in BIM knockout mice. And the reason is um, because there's impaired deletion to antigens expressed in the medulla. So we did a bunch of further experiments using TCR transgenic models, the OT1 model and the OT2. And these basically enforce the expression of a TCR that is reactive to just one antigen, ovalbumin. And when we crossed these mice to another transgenic that expresses a model organ-specific antigen over under an insulin promoter, we observe, normally, we observe deletion. So the thymocytes encounter their antigen in the medulla, and that kills them. But if we remove both Puma and BIM in, these, uh, in this scenario, in each of these TCR transgenic situations, we saw a, a release, of an inhibition of this deletion. And now what happens is OT1 and OT2 cells pour out into the periphery. These are autoreactive cells now that are coming out only when we remove both Puma um, and BIM. Direct evidence that there's a defect in deletional tolerance in the medulla of these mice, and that that's what's probably leading to this accumulation of mature thymocytes in the, in the medulla. Okay, then just to summarize this bit then, 
we found that only mice lacking both Puma and BIM succumbed to a spontaneous organ-specific autoimmune disease. We don't see that in BIM knockouts or any of the other double knockouts that we tested with the BH3-only genes. Among BH3-only proteins, only the additional loss of Puma exacerbated defects in thymic T-cell development that we see in BIM knockout mice. And this mainly affected the mature single positive cells that reside in the medulla. And the reason that's striking is because in the medulla, that's where air is expressed. That's where these organ-specific antigens are previewed to, um, to thymocytes before they exit. And that would normally be uh, leading to the deletion of those cells via both Puma and BIM. Thus, the compound loss of both Puma and BIM induced a large quantitative defect in the deletion of these TCR transgenic thymocytes in a model system. So we concluded that there is actually an important additional role for Puma in deletional tolerance to organ-specific antigens, okay, this one class of antigens. And so one way we might look at how, at how this, uh, one model that might sort of represent this best is if we have immature cells, the double positive thymocytes, if they encounter their antigen in the cortex, so this, this immature zone of the thymus, <coughs> the upregulation of BIM is sufficient to mediate the deletion of these cells. Okay, and that's why it may be in BIM knockout mice we see a systemic autoimmune disease against ubiquitous antigens. However, if they do not encounter that antigen, now it's blue, you'll notice, if they don't encounter that antigen in the periphery, they undergo the process of positive selection, they mature into single positive thymocytes and enter the thymic medulla. This maturation process is accompanied by many changes, including the upregulation of pro-survival molecules like BCL2. Now, if this mature thymocyte encounters its organ-specific antigen, this cognate antigen now, presented by medullary epithelial cells. It requires both the upregulation of BIM and Puma now to overcome this change in their survival machinery that's occurred to lead to the deletion of these cells in a different compartment. An implication of this sort of differential requirement for apoptosis is that autoimmune diseases, different kinds of autoimmune diseases, might arise due to defects in different apoptotic mechanisms. It's not just that one uh, that all roads lead to Rome. You need to have a certain apoptotic mechanism to delete particular cells. Okay, then, so if we come back to this question I asked at the beginning, about why don't BIM knockout mice get organ-specific autoimmunity? So we've got now experimental support for this second interpretation that other apoptotic mediators can do it. But you'll notice, though, that the one odd thing was that even though, as far as we can tell, we've caused an almost complete defect in thymic negative selection, it yields surprisingly mild autoimmune disease, okay? I showed you some of this lymphocytic infiltration in organs, but it's not killing the mice. Um, and it's nothing like what we see in, in other mouse models like um, FOXP3 deficient models, for instance, that kill the mice very early. So we decided then to explore this other concept that maybe T cell deletion is not absolutely necessary for immunological tolerance. And when we're looking for other mechanisms that might be sufficient to prevent autoimmunity, uh, regulatory T cells was an obvious place to look. So by way of introduction, I mentioned earlier that studies in this IPEX syndrome revealed the importance of FOXP3 for immunological tolerance. What happens in these patients is an early onset autoimmune and inflammatory disorder, and it's caused by loss of function mutations to this transcriptional regulator FOXP3 that's required for Tregs. It's required to cause a differentiation of a specialized kind of CD4 positive T cell, which we call Tregs and they're required throughout life. And what they do is prevent the inappropriate activation of conventional CD4 cells. Okay, this is a dominant tolerance mechanism. They act in trans to prevent the activation of other potentially dangerous cells. Okay, so we had some hints that the intrinsic pathway might be playing a role in Treg differentiation from some studies that Yifan Zahn did in Andrew Liu's laboratory. And here's just some figures taken from his paper that show in mice that lack the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, so backs and back deficient mice, in their thymus you can find a huge increase in the proportion of FOXP3 positive cells, these Treg cells. And that actually you can also see this in BIM knockout mice, and the numbers are even higher if you look in BIM, Puma and BIM deficient mice, indicating that the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis restrains regulatory T cell numbers under normal circumstances. So a corollary question we had about this then is, to what extent then does the apoptosis modify Treg generation in the thymus versus their homeostasis in the periphery? Now the reason we thought that their turnover in the periphery might be important is because Tregs turn over at a very high rate. Okay, so this graph here is just showing 
what happens after you deliver a milligram of BRDU? This is a nucleoside analog that's incorporated into the DNA of dividing cells. And you, what you can do is pulse mice with this and then track the percentage incorporation in various subsets. And so here in the black circles shows you the incorporation within this FOXP3 positive Treg compartment. And you notice that almost 10% of the cells incorporate BRDU after a single pulse, whereas their conventional counterparts only incorporate to about 3 or 4% indicating there's a much higher turnover of regulatory T cells compared to their conventional counterparts. So we were interested then what role, what role apoptosis might play in this very high turnover of regulatory T cells. Is that why maybe there's this expansion in the BAX-BAC deficient mice? So the way we chose to address this was to ask the question, does the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis govern Treg homeostasis in some manner? And so to do that, what we had to do is remove the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis after Tregs had developed in the thymus. And so the way we did that was to take advantage of a conditional deletion system using FOXB3 to drive the expression of a Cree recombinase, and that that would move a, remove a flocked allele of BACs. And we did all of this on a BAC deficient background because there's a high degree of redundancy between BACs and BACs. So only in cells where both are removed do you have a defect in the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. So in this case, that's in Tregs. So what did we see? What we saw was a big increase in the proportion of regulatory T cells defined here by expression of FOXP3 and TCR gated on CD4 positive cells from the spleen. We saw a big increase in the proportion of those cells in both the spleen and the lymph node. I'm just showing them graphically here. So again, spleen, lymph node. And the top graphs are showing the proportion of Tregs within the CD4 compartment. The bottom graphs are showing the overall number. And if you just focus on this right-hand column, that's the, the experimental mice, the FOXP3 Cree, Bax flox and back deficient situation. You can see there's almost a doubling in the number of FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells in these mice compared to a range of different genetic controls. Okay, so there's an increase in Treg numbers in these mice. The other really striking observation we made was that their rate of proliferation has really bottomed out. Okay, so there's an increase in their number, and if we use KI67 as a marker of those cells that happen to be in proliferative state at that stage, and gate on these Tregs, we see that this high proportion of Tregs that are normally turning over has dropped right down by about one-third to about one-third. Okay, so this then is evidence that the intrinsic pathway does actually regulate the number of regulatory T cells under steady state conditions. <coughs> so because we now we've highlighted a role for back and backs and indeed this intrinsic pathway in regulatory T cell homeostasis, we now ask the question then what pro-survival BCL2 family members are required to keep regulatory T cells alive to maintain immunological tolerance. Now, we focused on actually three of these pro-survival members, BCL2, BCL-XL, and MCL1. And if we look at their expression profile using this ImGen database and compare it to what we see in, re in conventional T cells, we found that for all of these, actually, regulatory T cells seem to express higher levels of BCL2, XL, and MCL1 than their conventional counterparts, suggesting that perhaps all of these are really important in maintaining, um, in maintaining their life. Um, in particular, we're interested in BCL2 because we'd shown in other experiments that overexpression of BCL2 led to this higher number of regulatory T cells that we observed in the BACs back deficient situation. Okay, so how do we go about testing the role of these different BCL2 family members? What well, was the classic way? We knocked it out and had a look at what would happen. And so for the BCL2 knockouts, these mice get a range of different health problems. And so we had to take fetal liver cells from either BCL2 wild type or BCL2 knockout mice and then reconstitute lethally irradiated recipients. When we did that and looked at regulatory T cell differentiation in the thymus or the spleen using FOXB3 and CD4, we basically saw no difference in the proportion and numbers of regulatory T cells that arose from the BCL2 knockout bone marrow. Okay, and that's shown here as well. So that was kind of a surprise because we thought based on our transgenic evidence, that BCL2 would be a critical pro-survival member maintaining the life of regulatory T cells. Okay, what about the next one? This is BCL-XL now. This is a gene name for it. And unfortunately, BCL-XL is required during thymic T cell differentiation. It's required by double positive thymocytes. So instead of this complete knockout situation, we had to resort again to the conditional deletion using FOXP3 Cree to delete a flox allele of BCL-XL. Okay, so what happens there? Again, we're looking at thymic and splenic Treg numbers, and we see, again, really no difference compared to the wild-type counterparts. The proportion and number of Tregs that arose 
in FOXB3, Cree, BCL, XL mice was basically the same. So XL is not important either. Where we did see an effect was when we made conditional mice that deleted a FLOX allele of MCL1 that probably many of you are familiar with by now. In that situation, it was only when both alleles of MCL1 were FLOX that we saw that the mice had impaired survival. They would start dying at around four weeks of age and continue such that all of the mice were gone by about three months of age. And the reason they were dying was because of this massive autoimmune and inflammatory attack that is characteristic of mice that are deficient in FOXP3. So here I'm just showing lymphocytic infiltration of the lung and small intestine. We also saw evidence um, here showing, this is a plot now of T cell activation, and you can see that in the mice that lack FOXP3, um, that lack MCL1 expression in Tregs, we saw higher evidence of T cell activation. Consistent with this was a hyper IgE phenotype that's also seen in the FOXP3 scurfy deficient mice. Uh, and this was all being caused by a crash in the numbers of regulatory T cells in FOXP3 Cre MCL1 deficient mice. It's not a complete absence, but there are many few regulatory T cells. And all of the other immunological signs that we could see indicated that there was a loss of tolerance due to the, this lack of regulatory T cells. Okay, so MCL1 seems to be the thing that's required by regulatory T cells to maintain their normal number and function. Now, that's all well and good, but we wanted to know whether regulatory T cells require MCL1 early on during their thymic differentiation, or whether it's a survival factor that's required throughout their life. And so to do this, so to assess this question, what we did was turn to an inducible model where we could inducibly delete MCL1 in just a portion of T reg cells. So it's kind of complex, so I'll take you through it. What we did was we irradiated a congenically labeled wild type mouse, and we reconstituted it with a mixture of bone marrow. 50% of the bone marrow was wild type in origin and was labeled with a congenic marker we could track. The other half of the bone marrow comprised, was taken from a mouse that expresses this Rosa Cree ER construct. So this is a, a Cree that's normally expressed and retained into the cytoplasm, but upon, a, in, uh, but upon ligation of the estrogen receptor with tamoxifen, it translocates the Cree into the nucleus and can lead to the deletion of flox alleles. In this case, we're testing BCL XL or MCL1. Okay, so half the bone marrow will be of this origin, and we can inducibly delete either BCL XL or MCL1. So we allowed these mice to reconstitute, gave them tamoxifen to induce this deletion, and then observed what would happen. And if you just focus on these dot plots down here, we're looking at LY5.1, this congenic marker. So all LY5.1 cells in the top of these graphs will be the wild type component, okay? The T regs that should not be affected. And on the x-axis, we're plotting FOXP3, so we can identify Tregs of either wild type or inducibly deleted origin. And in the treatment situation, we saw that the loss of BCL XL had no effect on regulatory T cell numbers or proportion, but the loss of MCL1 inducibly in this system led to a, a marked reduction in the numbers and proportion of regulatory T cells that we could recover, such that now the ratio of Tregs of this origin to the wild type origin is now much skewed in favor of the wild type Tregs. So the loss of MCL1 was a major competitive loss for the regulatory T cells. Okay, so then this is a bit of a scheme about how now we think the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis can regulate regulatory T cell homeostasis. And so the, the pools of conventional cells and Tregs are just sort of shown by the size of these circles. And regulatory T cells normally act to inhibit the activation of conventional cells. And this little arrow here just indicates to remind you that regulatory T cells have a very high turnover. Normally, the numbers, the size of the Treg pool is constrained by the activation of the intrinsic pathway mediated by BAC and BAX. However, in healthy Tregs, those ones that survive, this activation of BAC and BAX is held in check by MCL1. BCL2 or BCLXL are dispensable for the survival of regulatory T cells. Okay. So this is in the steady state conditions where we've just knocked it out and then seen what happens in the mice. Do we have any evidence that these pathways are important in the dynamic regulation of regulatory T cells during their homeostasis? So for that, we turn to a tricky model that was dreamt up by a, a collaborator of mine, Adrian Liston. And what he did was take advantage of the fact that FOXP3 is an X-linked gene. And so he introduced two alleles of FOXP3 one that drives the expression of the diphtheria toxin receptor, and another that just drives the expression of a thigh 1.1 marker allele that we can use to track the mice. 
When brought together in female mice, what this results in, due to X, random X inactivation, is a mixed population of regulatory T cells, half of which express the diphtheria toxin, and half of which express this thy 1.1 marker we can use to track uh, the response of this subset. And so what we would do then is in, in, uh, deliver diphtheria toxin and then track the response in the ter peripheral Treg pool over different time points. So what happens is represented on this graph. It's a little busy, but I'll take you through it slowly. On the y-axis, we have the proportion of regulatory T cells in each of these different compartments, okay? So in the black circles, it's total regulatory T cells. In the white circles, it's the thigh 1.1 Tregs. These are wild-type Tregs, if you like. And in the gray circles, we're showing you that those Tregs that express the diphtheria toxin, the ones that are gonna die as a result of the injection of diphtheria toxin at time zero. So what we observe then is an immediate drop in regulatory T cell numbers like you would expect. It drops to about 50% the normal numbers, and that's caused by the loss of this diphtheria toxin receptor positive Treg compartment. But what's striking is that there's a very quick recovery. In fact, there's an overshoot in the number of regulatory T cells such that by five days, there's about a 200% the normal level of regulatory T cells. And this has been driven by a response in this Psi 1.1 compartment, okay? You can see that the DTR positive Tregs never really recover. But these open circles here, the Psi 1.1 Tregs, respond by a massive expansion and then a very slow attrition. So it takes about another three weeks before the levels return to normal numbers. So there's this initial drop followed by a swift expansion of the Psi 1.1 Treg cells and they overshoot um, by about 200%. Now, there's a couple of things we had to address. One is people asked whether maybe the thymus could be you know, automatically producing many more Tregs, for instance, um, or could there be conversion of conventional T cells into regulatory T cells? I'll cut to the chase and tell you that the answer to both those questions is no. We did thymectomy experiments and also fate map, genetic fate mapping experiments to rule out both of these contributions, leaving us with the interpretation that it must be the intrinsic regulation of proliferation and apoptosis by the Psi 1.1 positive Tregs that are responding to this um, homeostatic challenge. We can see evidence of that if we gate now on these Psi 1.1 Tregs and look for evidence of proliferation using Ki67 or apoptosis using the activation of caspase 3. We find that after diphtheria toxin depletion of the Tregs, we find a, a swift increase, a massive increase actually, in the proportion of proliferating Tregs such that almost 80% of them now show evidence of proliferation. This is an accompanied by a drop in their rates of apoptosis, such that it starts at about 50% of regular T cells that show evidence of um, apoptosis, and this drops to about 20% and stays low for the, um, for the rest of the time course. So this expansion phase is driven by both increased proliferation and decreased apoptosis, whereas this subsequent attrition that I was showing you earlier on here, this down phase here, seems to be driven mainly by apoptosis because, uh, because the proliferation rate comes back down. Okay then, um, what's driving this whole process? Well, one very prominent candidate was IL-2. This is a cytokine that's required for T cell activation, but it's also known to be really important for regulatory T cells. And indeed, if we looked in the plasma of these mice, um, immediately after diphtheria toxin and depletion of regulatory T cells, we found that the levels of plasma IL-2 correlated and actually preceded the regulatory T cell homeostatic response to depletion, such that by day one, we could already see signs of increased levels of IL-2. This peaked at about day four. If you remember, the peak of the Treg response was at about day five, and then it slowly came down over the rest of the kinetic, um, as did the numbers of regulatory T cells. We found further evidence for this if we tried to block IL-2 in this partial depletion model. Okay, so again, we had the 50-50 split. You inject the mice with diphtheria toxin to remove, to kill 50% of the regulatory T cells. But at the same time, we also induced, uh, introduced a blocking antibody to IL-2. And then six days, look, six days later, and in this last column here, you can see that the proportion of regulatory T cells that would expand after this partial depletion was, was lower if we had blocking antibodies to IL-2. It's not completely ablated the response, but it's blunted it indicating to us that at least there's a partial role for IL-2 in driving this homeostatic expansion of regulatory T cells. Okay then, so what about MCL1 and all this intrinsic pathway? So one way we could try and visualize that was to take advantage of a feature of this MCL1 flox allele that Philippe made. 
and it's, it's quite smart. So what happens is when you delete MCL1, you actually bring in frame a human CD4 reporter, which is now under the control of the MCL1 promoter. Okay, so you can now take advantage of this, not only to look at deletion, but also to look at MCL1 expression levels. And so what we did then was use mice that have one flox allele that will give us this, and one ma mice that have a wild type allele to support the survival of the Treg cells. And we crossed them with a mouse that expressed Cre very early on during lymphoid development using IL-7 receptor Cre. So basically all lymphocytes will have, um, have one allele of this MCL1 promoter driving the human CD4 reporter. And if we then look at the expression levels of this MCL1 reporter throughout thymocyte differentiation or in T cells in the, in the spleen, what we observe is very dynamic regulation, such that the, the very early progenitors, the double negative cells, have relatively low levels of MCL1 read out by this human CD4 reporter. But these levels increase markedly in double positive thymocytes. So the double positives, those resting cell type I was telling you about, that are most numerous in the thymus. If those cells then have been positively selected down the CD8 lineage, we find that these high levels of MCL1 are maintained in the CD8 single positives. The same is true in Treg, so the, the CD4 single positives that express FOXP3. However, their conventional counterparts that don't express FOXP3 reduce the levels of MCL1 markedly in the thymus. Now, this relationship between high MCL1 in Tregs and low MCL1 in conventional cells is maintained to some extent in the periphery. So we're just showing you here. Here's the level we see in Tregs. It's about a third higher than what we observe in, in CD4 cells that are either naive or activated. Okay, so there seems to be some kind of dynamic regulation during differentiation, but what about in this homeostasis system? So what we did then is go back to this FOXP3 DTR system where we have one allele that's FOXP3 DTR, and then upon the injection of diphtheria toxin, we remove half of the Tregs and then look at what happens to MCL1 levels in the remaining half. And what happens is the transcription of MCL1 increases. Again, it's, it's a pretty subtle increase by about a third, but it coincides with just before the peak of the regulatory T cell expansion phase, if you like. So this is when the cells are receiving the highest levels of IL-2. We have evidence that actually other things are going on, like decreases in the level of BIM and so forth, that may lead to this net decrease in apoptosis that we observe during this homeostatic response. Okay then, so if we come back this, to this, this plot now. So we, we reckon that regulatory T cell numbers are maintained by the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, and that that's antagonized by the pro-survival activities of MCL1. Now in a situation where apoptosis Overrides, overrides this process so that Treg numbers come down, what we think is happening is that pro-apoptotic molecules like BIM, and we have evidence that there are others, overwhelm the pro-survival activity of MCL1 and lead to the activation of BAC and BACs, and that drives this reduced regulatory T cell pool. However, when you do that, you relieve this inhibition that Tregs normally impose on conventional cells. And so what that then leads to is a partial activation of conventional cells and they start releasing levels of IL-2 that we would see in our partial depletion model. This then leads to an upregulation of MCL1, and also we think downregulation of BIM, and the net effect of that is to, to stop activating back and backs in regulatory T cells, which allows them to recover to their normal, uh, normal numbers and reimposing this inhibition of conventional cells, and that maintains tolerance. Okay, so I'll just finish off with a few perspective slides then. One is, what do we think now about the relative importance of deletion compared to regulatory T cell activity? So I showed you in the first half that deletion by apoptosis is indeed necessary for immunological tolerance to both systemic and also peripheral self antigens. And that the apoptotic mediators required can vary depending upon the maturation status of the thymocytes. For instance, BIM can delete double positives, but it can't delete single positives on its own. That requires both BIM and PUMA. But what's interesting then is that there's a really high level of redundancy in the genetic basis of thymocyte deletion. So it's only when we remove both BAX and BAC, or both PUMA and BIM, that we really saw a major impact on thymocyte deletion. So that's four alleles that need to go missing in a person before you have a massive defect in thymocyte deletion. That's pretty unlikely. But what's more intriguing is that there actually seem to be similar mechanisms, similar apoptotic mechanisms that govern regulatory T cell homeostasis and even maybe their production. So this, this 
linkage, I guess, links defects in, uh, in deletion to amplification of this important immunoregulatory cell population. Okay, so if you screw with deletion, you end up with more Tregs. And that, that might lead to this scenario where defects in deletion are hugely buffered by changes in regulatory T-cell homeostasis. Maybe that's why we don't see a more dramatic disease in these mice that lack puma in BIM or that lack back and backs. And so then that leads to the question then really, is deletion actually dispensable for immunological tolerance after all? If you look at a lot of these genetic association studies for autoimmune diseases, you don't see things like BIM and puma coming up. You see MHC, you see immunoregulatory molecules like PTP and 22, but you don't see mediators of deletion. So maybe deletion, you know, if you have partial defects in it, we can just get on just fine. And finally, maybe some of this, um, this later part of the story I told you indicates that we can target regulatory T cell survival machinery to affect um, better outcomes in diseases. So there's accumulating evidence that imbalances in regulatory T cell number and function contribute to many immune dysregulations that lead to autoimmune diseases and cancer. And there's been over 350 clinical trials in the US that are aimed at modifying regulatory T cell number and function to treat autoimmune, malignant, or transplant conditions, yet none have been able to stably modify regulatory T cell number. And so one prospect then is that perhaps we could take advantage of the pathways we've identified here in regulatory T cells to modify their number and function in a variety of different diseases. Okay, and so with that, I'll just leave you with some acknowledgements. Um, these are the people in the lab that did most of this work. This is Antonia, um, Fiona, Rima, and Karis make the lab a really fun place to be, and I'm, I'm really pleased um, to have these people with me. Andreas has made all of these studies possible by providing mice, advice, um, direction when I've needed it. Uh, it's just been a fantastic mentor. Uh, Marco and Philippe have helped with advice and mice. Again, um, Gemma and Steffi made available many of the mouse strains that they already developed. Adrian Liston was a fantastic collaborator on the regulatory T cell work, and we continue that. These are two postdocs in his lab. Um, these people provided a lot of mouse reagents that we use. These people looked after a lot of the mice, because there are a lot. Um, and also, we could not have done this without um, the assistance from the flow cytometry core. Here's a picture of Andreas that you can find um, on Google. You'll notice he's got a timer and a radiation badge, two things I've never seen Andreas before, uh, and, and brown hair. But I like, <laughs> I like this one better. This one I found on Andreas's eHarmony profile. It's got some nice, <laughs> nice flowers and a lovely suit. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to take questions. Thanks. <laughs> I knew it was a bad idea to tease him first. So. <laughs> Jacques and then Alex. Is there any similarity between partial receptor occupancy and MCO level? Have you worked out? Yeah, that's true. No, it hasn't been worked out. So, <clears throat> IL 2 receptor occupancy leads to phosphorylation of STAT5. We don't know whether that's what leads to the increased levels of MCL1 or not. We have in vitro data that shows if you give T-Rex IL-2, MCL1 protein levels go up. So we presume that's the pathway that's being used, but we don't know that for sure. Good question. Alex. Um, in the first part of your talk, you showed that when you compromise apoptosis, you uh, can uh, see defects in negative selection that leads to autoimmune disease. Did you see any evidence of increased T-Rex numbers trying to fight back and um, yeah, you only see that in, in the, you see an increase in BIM deficient mice, and you see a further increase in puma BIM deficient mice. So rather than, rather than thinking of it and then trying to fight back and dampen the disease, I kind of think of it more that these, these two mechanisms that regulate regulatory T cells and deletion just happen to be linked. Um, and so a consequence of impairing deletion is that you end up with more T cells. Yeah. Sure. A very elegant talk. I just wondered, is anything known about how the C rates uh, control the autoimmune with conditional T cells? It's a, yeah, it's a million dollar question. Um, at the moment, it seems like there are many mechanisms that can do it. So people are using these conditional models and knocking out prospective mediators of suppression like IL-10 or uh, neuropillin was the latest one. And all of them seem to recapitulate aspects of the, the scurfy disease, the FOXP3 deficiency, but not all of it. 
Okay, so so it could be that there's just the sum of many different mechanisms, and T-Reg use one mechanism when they're in the gut, they use another mechanism when they're in the skin. Or it could be that there is one overriding mechanism that just hasn't been discovered yet um, that can account for all of the effects that we see um, in the skirt. So it looks like a grab bag of mechanisms at the moment. In your Cree uh, mice, with the conditional deletion of BCL XL and also of um, MCL1, on that slide, um, the changes in T-Reg numbers, I wasn't, I wasn't clear whether that was in uh, periphery or in the thymus. It was all in the periphery. So we let chimeries and establish, <coughs> then we inducibly deleted, and then within two days you can see this loss of regulatory T-cells um, in the periphery. And also, um, uh, you showed a partial mechanism through the uh, IL-2. I'm just curious, um, but with the uh, Change in T reg numbers. I'm just curious whether uh, it's possible that um, since you're <coughs> killing, say, 3% of the overall lymphocyte population there of the T lymphocytes, I'm curious whether it's possible the um, change in T reg numbers could be in response to the inflammatory milieu that's in response to that massive cell death. Yeah, um, we, we haven't done any experiments that rule that out. I don't know that there's evidence that the DT induces an inflammatory kind of cell death, it might, but. Um, we used a reporter of IL-2 production, a Thai-1 reporter, a novel mouse now, that showed that the source of the IL-2 is coming from the conventional CD4 cells, the ones that the Tregs regulate. Yep. Now, we don't know whether that's in response to the loss of Tregs or, or maybe the cell death, but certainly that seems to be the critical thing to drive a homeostatic response to increase regulatory T cell numbers. I also think that IL-2 probably is the main thing. It's just we've had to use a blocking antibody for what is a really a paracrine factor. So I don't think that the IL-2 antibody is, is good enough, but I think that's the major thing. Thanks. Andrew. Andrew. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. The, uh, I found it very interesting in your DTR experiments that you treated, even though you only treated three times with DT, those cells never come back. Oh, only once. Yep. And they never come back. Is it? Is it because the other cells are multiplying? But even when the other cells stop multiplying, they still don't come back. No, that's right. Yeah, I think they're at a competitive disadvantage now. The, 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 now, if you want to think of it, the precursor frequency of those DTR positive T rex is so low that they just simply it would take them a long, long time to even get back to the level, you know, to have a 50 50 um, relationship with the other regulatory T cells. Those other ones have such a head start, they're 90% of the T rex population now. That, that's the yeah, This is a competitive disadvantage. Your last slide suggests clinical applications, but haven't people activated T regular cells in vitro to, to expand them and then put them back in vivo? What then happens? They go away. Because the homeostatic mechanisms I was just talking about bring T reg numbers back down. So if you give a bolus of regulatory T cells, there's only so much IL 2 that's going to sustain those cells in the system. And so the numbers steadily come back down. Even if you put in the IL 2. You would then, now people are trying that, they're trying to give people um, IL 2 to support to support those um, regulatory T cells. But how about IL 7? I don't know if people have done IL 7. I don't that that could also do it, but because um, it would activate normal T cells. IL-7, yeah, I don't know if that would activate it here. The IL-2 might. So that's that's the problem with using IL-2 in um, in these settings to support T reg growth. I think we're better off aiming at the pathways you were referring to at the very beginning, those pathways that transduce the survival signal in regulatory T cells to try and change regulatory T cells without altering large immune profiling like IL-2 with, with conventional cells. Um, just one comment slash question from me before we end up, and that is, since the genome-wide association studies haven't really shown any polymorphisms in the or tumor backs, you know, the immune diseases, maybe what you showed with T-Rex, maybe what people should look at is polymorphisms in MCL1 or MCL1 regulators, because you could imagine if they, those levels are down and something else is down, then the T-Rex function might fall below the threshold that would protect human from getting autoimmune disease. Do you know if anybody has actually looked at that sort of problem? No, no, I'm not aware of that. It's something I'll go back and look at now. Maybe Len does, he's got his hand up. No, no, I'm just going to say that um, in diabetes, in humans and in mice, there are genetic polymorphisms of an IL-2. 
and, um, and, it, and that's been proposed to be responsible for defects in T-Rex in those situations, but I don't think it's been linked to MCL1. Yeah, I reckon we, we want to look at regulators of MCL1 because if you look at the transcriptional responses I showed you during T-Rex homeostasis, we're not terribly impressive, but I'm, I'm sure though that regulators of MCL1 protein half-life and things like that may have a more potent uh, role to play in, these, uh, in regulatory detail homeostasis and maybe that's the point. Well, I'm fine, it remains to thank uh, Daniel for very